Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, the Early Risers event, Teaching Anti-Racism. We're so happy to have you here. My name is Melissa Townsend, and I'm producer of the podcast, Early Risers. It's a new podcast hosted by Diane Halsey, all about how to talk with very young children about race and racism. I want to tell you a, a quick story about the podcast and how it relates to you. In June 2020, Diane Halsey wrote an essay for her organization's blog. Her organization is called Think Small. And it was uh, after the murder of George Floyd. And she talked about how racism and implicit bias were at the heart of what happened to George Floyd. And because she's in early childhood, she traced that back to early childhood, to our young, young years. And she said, if we're gonna do anything about racism and implicit bias, we're going to have to start with the youngest children. Now, many of us are here today and we agree. We say, yes, I'm completely down with that. But our second thought is, uh, I, I don't have any idea how to do that. <laughs> I don't know how to teach my child to be anti-racist. I myself do not have all the answers. I think that, that uh, those thoughts are different in the minds of white people and in the minds of BIPOC people. And when I say BIPOC, I mean Black, Indigenous, and people of color. We, we are all in a moment where this conversation needs to happen, and it needs to happen with the youngest children. So Diane Halsey has the idea to start a podcast. Now here's uh, where I need to give some credit. It's a collaboration between Minnesota Public Radio and Little Moments Count. And for those of you who don't know, Little Moments Count is a Minnesota-based coalition of organizations focused on supporting the development of young children birth to age three. And the podcast is supported by Health Partners and the Galleria in Edina, Minnesota. In each episode, Diane Halsey talks with an early childhood expert about how do we teach our children to be anti-racist. Now, I'm the producer of this show, so I get to be a part of every single episode. And I tell you, I've been trying all of it out with my two children at home. <laughs> and uh, it's been an incredible experience uh, that I've had personally um, just listening and, and practicing what I'm hearing. So today is basically an expanded version of a podcast episode. We have three panelists with us today, and I'm going to introduce them to you now. First, we have Diane Halsey, the host of the Early Risers podcast. She's been in early childhood for 30 years, and she's an advocate and a leader in the field. Hello, Diane. We also have Dr. Bridget Vitrup. She is professor at Texas Women's University. She talks about the racial socialization of children, basically how families talk or don't talk about race and racism with their children. And finally, we have Dr. Rosemary Allen. She is president and CEO for the Institute for Racial Equity and Excellence. She's a nationally respected teacher and trainer of implicit bias and culturally responsive practices. In fact, she's so popular, she has led trainings for both our other panelists. <laughs> So welcome to our panel. And today, uh, moderating our discussion is Deshaun Drew. He has been in journalism for over 25 years. He was an education reporter in both Texas, where Bridget is, and in Minnesota. And he is now president of Minnesota Public Radio. Now, I hope our audience is showing up today with a lot of questions. And I hope that you leave today with some answers. Now, I'm sorry to say you won't have all the answers by the end of this conversation, but you will be on the journey. And I hope that can you, I think that you'll be able to leave with some things that you can try out with your children, your students, and that you can talk about with the other adults in your life. So thank you for being here. And I hand it over to Deshaun. Thanks so much, Melissa. So, you know, this podcast, as Melissa said, began because they had this idea that, you know, we needed more conversation. And, and you know, I would argue that probably, as, as I'm a parent myself, that, that Black, Indigenous, and other people of color are raising children have been talking about race with our kids forever. Um, but it would seem that it's been less common with white parents and their children. And, and my, my sense is, in the heels of George Ford's murder and the broader racial reckoning, it spurred that there are more conversations. But I'm curious to hear, and I'll start with you, Rosemary, uh, just what your sense is about whether that's changing, whether we're, we're engaging, not just as, as adults, right, but with our children 
more around these issues? Do you, you have any sense of that? Deshaun, I'd like to think so. I believe that the murder of George Floyd heightened our awareness and the need to talk more about race. The only issue is that in order for families, for parents to talk to their children about race, they have to develop a comfort talking about race themselves. And as you said, many white families have not had this conversation. Their families did not talk to them about race. And one of the reasons for that is that their white skin has served as a protective barrier. And their survival was not connected to their skin color. So they didn't have to talk about race as much. And, and because um, they're, they're part of the dominant culture and dominant society, it just didn't come up very much. So one of the things that we have to do as adults is to develop a comfort level talking about race, especially to children. I was at the supermarket once and I was coming down an aisle and a little white child ran a around the corner and almost bumped into me. And he said, oh, you're black. And I said, yes, I am. And you're white and you have blue eyes, but I don't, my eyes are brown. He goes, how come your eyes are brown? I said, cause my dad's eyes are brown. I got it from him. And about that time, his mother came around the corner and I was so happy that that little guy and I had those few seconds because typically when that happens, and that wasn't the first time, the, the mother or father will shush the child, mm -hmm. think it's offensive, not talk about it. And I believe that years of being shushed and shamed for noticing and identifying race have created a fear with talking to our children about race and for children even bringing up the topic. I do believe it's changing, but it's gonna take some work. So it's underway. No, no. Oh. Bridget, you've done some research, obviously, in this area. What's your sense of, of why white folks don't talk about race? What, what are you seeing? What, what, what kind of bubbles up for you as we talk about this? I, what I generally hear from parents is a, a lot of white parents feel that it's important to talk about it. They just don't really know how. Some of the, the major reasons that they're giving is, first of all, they want their children to be colorblind or they already perceive their children to be colorblind. And this is also part of, you know, kind of what came out after the civil rights movement. I, now we have to be colorblind so that people are not judged by the color of their skin. Um, and so it's very well intended, but the problem is that society is not colorblind. We're not at that stage. Um, and, and so what I try to tell parents, especially white parents, is that the colorblind approach tends to just preserve the status quo because we're not acknowledging uh, the, the biases and discriminations and in the inequities that are still existing. Um, and so even when they get to the point also where they understand we have to talk about it, some parents feel like their children are too young mm -hmm. um, or they feel um, I will talk about it if something comes up, but it's never come up. And as, as Rosemary said, um, children learn very early on that this is not something that we talk about. And so they don't mention it, they don't ask questions. Um, and then a, another big reason is also they just don't know how because they didn't grow up talking about race and race related issues. So they feel very uncomfortable with it. They're afraid of saying the same thing, especially because the stereotype that's out there that when white people talk about race, it's because they're racist or they're afraid to say something that's gonna come across as racist. And so they're just not comfortable talking about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no, no progress, no, no, no action, huh? <laughs> you know, one of the things that, that I, I wonder about is this, this sense that, um, bring it up may make our children feel sad, feel bad, feel guilty, that it'll, it'll bring emotions up for them mm -hmm. that uh, that they think won't be healthy or that they won't be prepared to handle in the moment. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'll start with, with you, Rosemary. How do you, how do you think about that aspect of it, that there's a sense of protecting white children in particular, to be specific once again, from all the emotions that may come in, in having real conversations about race? We, what we have to understand, Deshaun, is that children are aware of race long before we have these conversations. Yes. They're aware of race 
as infants. They notice differences. Um, infants prefer the same race caregiver. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever heard of something called perceptual narrowing, up until nine months of age, an infant can distinguish the face of any race. Unless we expose them to different races, they're, after nine months of age, they can't. They can easily dis distinguish the faces of the um, people of their own race, but not of other races. That's why you hear this saying, mm -hmm. all black people look alike, or you think all Asians look alike. And it's because we've lost the ability to distinguish without relationships. Mm -hmm. So that's one part. By the time a child is two years old, they're already beginning to classify based on skin color and hair texture. By the time they're three, they're adding value to that. And this is where those feelings come in. They're picking up from society that some people are more valued than others. Some people are more respected, respected than others. Some people are more dispensable than others because we know that black children are suspended from preschool at disproportionate rates. So when they see their black classmates have to leave and they're in trouble all the time, that's what's creating sadness. And they're aware of what's fair and not fair. So if we don't talk to children about race, there's nowhere for those feelings to go and be labeled. Mm -hmm. Children are aware, but if we don't talk to them, then they draw their own conclusions based on their very limited information. And then they, 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 they use the cues that we give them. So when we go to the supermarket and we say, don't say that to that lady, or we're always asking white people for help, or if we avoid the Spanish speaking person, we're teaching our children to avoid those people without yeah. ever talking about it. And that's where those complex and um, unresolved feelings come from. It's not talking about race. It's actually not talking about race. And there are consequences. They're paying attention, is what I hear you saying. They're picking up all the cues, intended and unintended, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we have an opportunity to, to be intentional about what we, what we teach them. Um, you know, as we think about along those lines, what are some of the maybe do's and don'ts that come to mind? I'll start with you, Diane, with this one. You think about sort of, this is, this is for many people, it feels like it's fraught territory, right? And, and so people would rather be frozen than make a mistake. Richard spoke yeah. that a moment ago, right? Like when you think about how to get people to, to move off of the square that they're on, that they're frozen on, what kind of advice might you give that are things that they should try to do and maybe some things they should be intentional to not do in this space? Yeah, that's actually a really good question, Deshaun. And I wanna build off a little bit about what M Rosemary was saying about how children learn. Just a very brief about early childhood development. First of all, children are sponges especially very young children, they are picking up everything in their environment. They're picking up what you say. They're picking up what you don't say. They are picking up your body language. Um, so they're picking up all of that. And, um, and the vast majority of learning, there's a lot of learning and brain development that happens um, even before a child is five years old. So there's a lot happening in those first few years for a child as they are developing. And one of the things that, um, that, that happens is that when we don't talk about, as Rosemary was saying, when we don't talk about race, children learn that it's a taboo topic. Um, but so what they're left with is to learn from their caregivers implicit biases. So the caregivers, so these biases are, are biases, they're implicit, which means their caregiver may probably does not even realize that they have them. So for instance, if you are walking into the grocery store, as, as stated, with your child and your body tenses up, maybe you pull your purse or your bag a little closer to you, you may not even realize you do that your child will pick that up and they may not even realize they're picking that up, but they are. And so as they grow, they will learn that their body will tense up when they see a person of color or a black person because their caregiver's body tensed up and pulled in. And so one of the main things to do is to be aware, is to be aware of our bodies and our language. Um, and, and so that when those things happen, because the opposite is true too. So if you don't tense up, then your child will learn 
you know, I don't, there's nothing, you know, my body doesn't change when I see a person of color. So it's to be aware of things that are happening in your body. Uh, I think the other thing is there is a lot of, you talked about that fear that happens. I, I, so I freeze up. And, um, and there's a lot in that freezing. And part of what's happening with that freeze is I don't want to say the wrong thing. And um, I think that there is something to be said for, um, you know, not worrying as much about saying the wrong thing and making sure that you are speaking about it. And so, because as I said, if we don't talk about it at all, children learn and they grow up that we can't talk about this. But if you say something, you're opening up the door for conversation and you're letting that child know that, yes, you can come and you can ask me questions about this and we can talk about that. And it's also okay to say, you know what? I don't know. So maybe we can find out together, mm -hmm. you know? And so just opening up that conversation is what's really important. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't. Bridget, s similar sort of question, which is sort of you think about somebody who's who's wants to step and wants to do the right thing, but is so worried about doing the wrong thing. Are there some basic, you know, things you would encourage them to start with or to to avoid? <laughs> Usually, the only thing I tell people to avoid is silence. Um, to really don't, don't say nothing, say something. Um, but a lot of people who are not used to talking about it, I recommend, especially for children, um, using books or videos as a springboard. There's a lot of great books out there. Um, Teaching for Change has a whole host of um, book recommendations. They're divided into age groups and topics. They have a whole social justice collection. And so use the book because it can be hard to start this conversation if you're not used to talking about it because you don't really know how, what to say or how to start. So use these books, but don't just read the books to your child or with your child. Actually talk about what's in the book and engage the child in conversation. What do you think about that? Have you ever seen something like that? What would you do? What can we do? Um, because again, as Diane said, um, it opens up. The, the conversation. Um, and, and I tell parents all the time, you're not always going to get it right. You're not always going to have the right answers. I talk about race and race related issues all the time, and I don't always get it right. But it, it's important to know that this is not a one time conversation yeah. or something that we do because it's MLK Day. So let's sit down and talk about it. These are ongoing conversations. And the more you talk about it, the more comfortable you're gonna get. And even if you feel like you said something wrong or this didn't really come out the right way, you have so many more opportunities to keep the conversation going. Uh, and then what you'll see is that as the children learn, it's okay to talk about it. They will start mentioning things and commenting and asking questions, and that will help the, the conversation to continue. Mm -hmm. an avenue for it to be an ongoing discussion rather than one and done. I mean, think about worrying about making mistakes. I mean, parents have that same concern in other aspects of raising their children, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the list seems never ending. And, and to your point, you know, it's not going to be something that you can't return to over and over and over again in, in navigating it. So, you know, one of the things that has really stuck out in the last year is, is you know, much more discussion about racism, but there's also been a lot of, of racialized violence that we've seen all across the country in the last year. And it, it once again, something our children notice. And I'm curious about, um, so with you, Dr. Allen, you know, on the heels of George Floyd's murder, you know, that was obviously viewed uh, it, it, through a racial lens. And we've seen, you know, in the midst of the pandemic, a lot of anti-Asian violence springing up all across the country. Um, it's, it's in the news, sometimes in our families, um, neighbors, obviously. How do you think about approaching those kinds of discussions where violence is a dimension of it, and so it's maybe a slightly different um, level of heaviness for, for, for young children to confront? Absolutely, and this, and this is difficult to do. Um, first, I do wanna say that this is one of those cases you wanna limit 
what your children see, limit their consumption of this. And children, especially young children, they don't have the capacity and to differentiate time and sequence of events. So for some children, when they watch this, they think it's a new event every time. Mm -hmm. So George Floyd's murder being played, oh, it happened mm -hmm. again and again and again. They don't have the capacity to differentiate that this is the same video. And then you I, answer their questions. When Bridget said silence is the worst, answer their questions and talk about it. Young children understand fairness, what's fair and what's right. And you can talk about how unfair it is that some people are treated badly, some people are hurt, and some people are even killed because of the color of their skin. Is that fair? Is that right? You know, those are the conversations we can have because if you've ever worked with a three, four or five year old, that's not fair, I didn't get my turn. Or also we treat people the way we want to be treated. And we don't treat people differently because of the color of their skin because everyone is important. Children saw a lot of protests and they didn't understand it. Why are people yelling and why are there police officers? And you can talk about the importance of taking action. They saw this happen, it wasn't fair, and now they're using their voices to let people know it wasn't okay. So I think it's important for us to um, have these conversations, to appeal to the stage of development where the child is. You don't wanna go into a lot of deep explanations to a four-year-old where you know there's institutional and systemic racism that, that's beyond their capacity. But again, to talk about fairness, right and wrong, using their voices, all the things they're learning anyway in their early childhood environment is how we address that. Thank you. And, and certainly there are times when particular groups are, are blamed for, targeted for things that bubble up. I mentioned, you know, the, with the pandemic, there was a lot of anti-Asian hatred and violence that, that erupted. Bridget, what did you see in, in looking into this and the research that you've done in that arena? I think, I think certainly over the last couple of years, there has been um, more acknowledgement of it, more acknowledgement am among um, white families that we do have to talk about this because they are, they're seeing what's going on. Um, they're recognizing that their children are seeing these things. Um, even for my own children, um, they're now eight, eight and 13. Um, but when they were younger, like when everything happened with George Floyd, um, my daughter was seven at the time and she was exposed to that, even though, you know, you can, you can try and limit a lot of it. Um, everything my son saw was on YouTube and TikTok. And so they are just constantly being bombarded with this information um, and, and again, trying to make sense of it. And so I do think that there is more of a recognition, even among white families that um, it is important to talk about it. And so I think we have an opportunity um, to move forward now um, with, with these conversations. Yeah, I mean, Twin Cities was ground zero with George Floyd, you know, dying on the streets of Minneapolis, Diane. How, how did you see that sort of play out in the conversations you were in with, with friends, neighbors, coworkers? I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was here, yeah. right? It was very, yes. very close to home. <laughs> it, it was, and it was um, very painful. I mean, even now it's still very painful. And, um, and I think there was a lot of mixture of emotions and we had lots of even internal conversations at work. Um, I think um, there was a lot of anger and that also is, is something that's um, difficult, but a conversation that needs to be had with young kids is the anger. And, you know, um, for young children, you know, you know, kind of like what Bridget is saying, especially here when it's happening all around, they're picking up all of this. You know, they're picking up the anger that their parents are feeling. They're picking up, you know, there's many, you know, white people that were embarrassed and ashamed at what happened, quite frankly. And so they're picking, you know, all of that up, you know, as well. Um, and so uh, 
And so I think one of the things that, um, that, that did become clear to me and one of the reasons why I even wanted to start early risers or you know, just this conversation is that um, that feeling, it cut across every, you know, it didn't matter um, what color you were, it didn't matter your socioeconomic background, um, it didn't matter, um, you know, you know, if you had children or not, um, somehow you were affected by that event in some way. And without us being able to talk about it, without us being able to process it, and even with our children, um, we're, you know, it didn't want that event to happen without it meaning something. And so it can't really mean something unless we talk about it and process what it really means and how does that happen? How, how do we get from, like, how does that just happen? And I think that is the ultimate question that many people were asking, like, how does that just happen? And, it, and, the, and the answer is, I don't have all the answers, but, I, but this answer is it doesn't just happen. You know, there are years that go into um, uh, building um, a, an attitude um, that acts, you know, that can act itself out in the events that happened to George Floyd. And so, um, so being able to have the conversation so that it doesn't happen again um, became very important to me. And to, I think to a lot of people um, around me too that I'm, that I'm talking with be proactive and to address some of the root causes and not be so solely focused on the, the, the latest event that's been a string, right? right? <laughs> so focused on the latest event that we're not actually addressing uh, the bigger issues. Right. So we've got some, some uh, of our audience members have questions. And so one is, as an educator and a parent, how do I counter the conflation of culturally responsive teaching with critical race theory? Who wants that one? I'll take that one. <laughs> Let me start by saying this. So many of you have heard of the 20, 60, 20 rule. 20% 20 of people are going to be on your team no matter what. Deshaun, no matter what you do, you have 20% of the people in your life who are cheering you, you on and they are team Deshaun. There's 60% of the people in your life that you can influence. Teach me, show me. Okay, I'm hearing you. Then there are 20% that you will never, ever, ever influence no matter what. They don't wanna hear it. There's nothing you can do to change their minds ever. The problem with that is that we spend about 60% of our, of our time on that 20%. Shift that, spend the time on the 60%. You should be spending about 95% of your time on the 60% because you already have the first 20. You're never going to get the, the third, that other 20. So the people who would conflate culturally responsive practices with critical race theory, I'm making a generalization here, they're part of that 20% because it's just not connected. They're looking for an excuse to attack, to diminish, to, dis, to, to somehow um, decline the, the, the need for culturally responsive practices. You can explain what it is. You can talk about why it's beneficial for all children, but don't spend too much time if they continue to say, well, this has been banned and this is gonna make my child feel real bad about themselves because that's not what it's about. Mm -hmm. Inform, educate, and then if you're convinced they're in that 20%, you're gonna to have to let it go. Thank you. And Bridget, let's build off of that a bit more too, because there is this, you know, I'm sure a number of people who, who are on with us right now are educators looking for ways to be more effective in this space. And so when you think about um, being at the head of the classroom and trying to, you know, make sure that all of the smiling faces looking up at you feel seen and valued. And, and then you kind of look at this, this, this question of, you know, culturally relevant to critical race theory. How do, how do you think about and talk about that when you're, when you're trying to help educators um, show up as their best selves and raise healthy children, regardless of what they look like? 
Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I've done some research with um, elementary school teachers um, and what some of the barriers that they're facing is they're afraid to, to bring up anything related to race even in their discussions, uh, either because they don't feel that the school administration or the district is supportive of it, or they're afraid that parents might complain. And some of them have had um, that happen where parents have complained about it. Um, and then also they're just, they don't know how to fit it into their schedule because if it's not part of the curriculum, then they're not really sure how to, how to bring it up. But there are many things that you can do also to spark those conversations. Like when you assign readings to the students, you know, make sure that you are including authors of, of all colors and talk about their history. Um, even in, um, if they're taking an art class, you know, present artists that are of um, different cultural backgrounds, different um, races and ethnicities. And then try to stay away from this um, tourist curriculum where um, we talk about um, the history of Black people on MLK Day or during Black History Month. We talk about, you know, the American Indians um, right around Thanksgiving, that, that there are conversations that happen um, because these children, they're yours when they're in the classroom, but they also have these lives outside where they're being exposed to things. They're being exposed to a lot of things. Um, at recess or in the classroom, I hear teachers talking about some of the things that they have overheard. Um, it's really quite amazing what they sometimes overhear children say, or um, they're aware of um, kids engaging in, you know, excluding other kids because of their race or their background. Um, and so I think that it's important if a kid says something, if you see something happening, to actually address it. Um, at that moment, because if you don't address it, it also makes the children of color feel devalued because we're not kind of sticking up for them, explaining things, talking about their history. Um, and, and then I think it's important when you do present these historical perspectives, because it's important to learn the history. And I think a lot of times um, in the classrooms, teachers will feel more comfortable talking about the history, because we have books and resources, we can talk about, you know, the history of slavery, we can talk about what happened to the American Indians, but it's important to also bring it up to what's going on today uh, and, and what is still happening so that we don't present it in a way that, you know, that was then and this was really bad, but we're way better now. Um, because sometimes that might be what, what the kids um, are experiencing. So glad we're done with all that racism stuff and we fixed it. <laughs> it, it comes across that way yeah. sometimes if you talk about, you know, um, I see some of the, I mean, even in, in early child care centers where they will talk about, um, you know, MLK, for example. And I had a teacher um, one time ask a question because she said, I thought I did everything right. I read this book. Uh, it was on MLK Day. Um, they, they read the book uh, about what Martin Luther King did. They talked about, you know, Jim Crow laws and how black and white kids couldn't go to the same schools or drink from the same water fountain. And then uh, this teacher got approached by a parent who said that her kid came home and said, did you know my teacher said that black and white kids are not supposed to be in the same classes and they shouldn't play together. And so they're making this whole um, new story out of it. Mm -hmm. And we see it also in research on, um, you know, stereotypes and how kids have these stereotypes. Um, and, and we try to present these books that have a counter narrative where, you know, now it's um, a black woman who is the principal, but then the kids somehow in their own mind, when they retell the story, she was the lunch lady, because those stereotypes are already so ingrained. And so, um, these things are gonna happen, but what's important is that we continue having these conversations. Again, we don't just sit down on MLK Day and, and read this book. Like we talk about what was happening then and what's still happening now, but we continue that conversation so that they don't come away from it having misunderstood it because again, they put sort of their own explanation into it based on their limited understanding of it. Yeah, one bite at the apple once a year isn't gonna get it done. You know, Diane, you've talked about you know, different ways to, to 
lean into this work through conversations. And, and, and I'm curious about how you think about curiosity in this space, you know, for, for caregivers, teachers and other caregivers, how, how curiosity kind of fuels the way you approach this and maybe some advice for others in similar situations. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things I have really, you know, I, you know, I've learned a lot, you know, even doing these, these podcasts and these interviews from people. And I think one of the things is, um, is, is somebody said earlier, this is not a one and done conversation. And so to be able to kind of look at it more like a journey, I think is important and to be curious about, about things, to be curious about how your child is interacting and, and experiencing race and racism. Um, and to be able to, um, to be thinking about these things and uncovering them for yourselves. Because when you're curious, then your child learns to be curious as, as well. Um, and so, and, and looking at it like a journey then also um, hopefully will, you know, get you away from the, from the thought that you need to say everything perfectly right up at the beginning. Cause you're not, that's just not going to happen. Um, nobody is perfect at this. And so being able to look at it as, you know, I'm just going to see how, um, you know, just learn this and, 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 and take a journey with this. There's one thing I want to say about that too. And I think it goes back a little bit to, um, the, the, um, the, the criticisms about critical race theory. Um, as you're taking this journey, I think it's important to know that it's not always going to be a comfortable journey. Uh, this, this, there's times when you need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I think one of the big reasons why um, there's so much, there's a backlash about critical race theory is because it makes white people feel uncomfortable. And our culture, you know, in America uh, defaults back to creating environments that make white people feel comfortable. And so I think especially as, as a, if you're a, a, a white parent, um, you, you may have to just say that outright, this is not going to be comfortable for me and that's okay. I'm just going to have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable in certain spaces um, and do what you need to do to support yourself around that, you know, um, but just know it's, it's not always going to be comfortable. Are you always comfortable, Diane, moving to this world? No, <laughs> <laughs> I am not. <laughs> so, Rosemary, you're an expert in culturally responsive practices. So tell me about a practice that promotes equity and, and, and engagement, like specific things. I'd love for folks to come away with a better sense. And I'll sprinkle this a few more times. Like, a, try this. Well, you know, Deshaun, a culturally res responsive environment, especially a classroom, is one that is designed with each child in mind. When they walk into the classroom, it should scream, I created this just for you. Mm -hmm. Children should be reflected in positive ways in every aspect of the room. A culturally responsive classroom is one where children's names are pronounced correctly. So Patricia, here's her name pronounced as Patricia, the way her mom says it, and not Patricia. It's an environment where all children are equally valued, where we don't hear one child's name consistently weaponized, Connor don't, Connor sit. But when we speak their names, we're speaking it through love and nurturance, even when they may be in the middle of some challenging behaviors. Mm -hmm. A culturally responsive classroom is one where teachers are modeling respect for other cultures. It's where things like race is talked about freely, where someone can say, oh, look, the, this girl in this book has skin just like yours, Diane. And Diane can say, yes, she does. Her hair is like mine too. It's where children see themselves and they know they're valued, where their families are welcomed and everyone sharing cultures, where, where whatever languages children and families and staff members speak are not only evident and being spoken, but also taught to children. I, um, I had a program where the children sang Twinkle Twinkle Little Star in five languages and every day they could choose which language they wanted to sing it in. That's what a culturally responsive classroom looks like. Great examples. So 
Richard, I've got one for you. When you think about this this space, you know, many of the children in in our communities and our families are biracial. A number of them are children of color who come from other parts of the world. How does a conversation maybe maybe how is it maybe a little different in some instances given those particular realities where someone isn't isn't just black or just Asian or Latina or Native American, but maybe a blend of, of two or three or more traditions. And, and, and another dimension, as I said, is sometimes we've got children who've been brought over from other parts of the world, now new Americans, right? But they still carry, right, look and, and, and um, depending on how old they are, the sound of where they're from. Yeah, I think it's, and, and my children are in, in um, are part of, that group, my husband is black, our children are biracial. So we have had uh, a lot of conversations because in our family, it's we felt that that's been really important um, to talk about it and to talk about um, both backgrounds uh, and, and to kind of leave it open for them. Because one thing that happens too is that biracial children um, often feel like you know, they go through their identity development and, and try to figure out who am I and how do I identify? And that can change multiple times throughout, you know, as, as the child gets older. Um, and so oftentimes what happens is society kind of puts a label on them uh, and tries to, to put them into a box. It's like, no, you, you would think that if a kid was, you know, half one race and half another that they could just freely choose how they wanted to identify, but that's not how uh, it generally works. And so, um, especially for children that are um, black, white, biracial, um, sometimes find themselves in a space where either, you know, they can't claim they're white, they can say they're black, but then in certain situations, they're not black enough. Um, and so we, we have family and friends um, where their children have gone through that. And so I think it's very important to kind of um, make sure that you present the family background and the heritage uh, of both sides. And if it's a matter of uh, transracially adopted children, that parents are very mindful of presenting, um, you know, their background as well so they can learn about their own heritage because over time they will figure out what they're most comfortable with if we have a lot of open conversations and we allow them to freely explore that <clears throat> because you can also sometimes see a situation where one um, one parent kind of wants them to identify as, as their side um, and then if that doesn't happen that you know might create some conflict or really that, that the parent feels sad about that and the kids pick up on that. Um, but there are, I mean, the, the number of multiracial and interracial families and multiracial um, children, it's growing. Um, and so it really is important that we also leave a space for them. For so long, the, um, the, when the census came out, um, you had to pick one race. Um, now you can pick multiples. <clears throat> Although, you know, some, I, I had to um, register my son at the hospital. He had to have his adenoids removed when he was 18 months old. And so it, in the pre-screening, um, the, the person from the hospital had called and she asked, you know, what is, the, um, what is your race? And I said, I was white. What is your husband's race? I said, I was black. She goes, what is your child's race? And at that point I thought, well, that's obvious. I said, well, he's, he's biracial because that's how we identify him. Um, or identify our children. Um, and then there was silence and she said, if you had to pick one. And I said, well, I'm not really sure I want to pick one. Like, she said, I can only <laughs> check one box. And then I thought about it for a while. I was like, okay, he's black. Then afterwards, I have this cognitive dissonance and this internal struggle. Like, why did I say black? Like I couldn't say white, but why can't I say white? And I, I understand sort of the historical context and why and my husband and I had a conversation about it. When he got home that day, <clears throat> I told him about it. And, and he was like, you said black, right? <laughs> For him, that was really important. And so we've had a lot of these yeah. types of conversations that... <clears throat> for monoracial families or not conversations that come up, but it just goes to show that our society just hasn't quite mm -hmm. caught up with, 
you know, where we really are into, I mean, you could say the same thing for, for gender identity as well, but, mm-hmm. um, but for race, um, certainly, I mean, in the school district, um, we were able to do for the registration to select both racial groups on um, the little demographic sheet that we had to turn in. But when you just look at the registration, like online, it only shows one. So there, they're white, but in the hospital system, they're, they're black. And so it, it just kind of is, is interesting. And I think it's extra important to have those conversations. Um, and, and there are more and more books coming out too. Again, I, I oftentimes go back to using these books, developmentally appropriate books for their age group, for them to learn. Um, to understand, to fully understand their heritage and to teach them that, you know, it, it's okay to talk about this and it's okay for them to go through this journey and identify how they feel is, fits with them and their identity. Yeah. And you and your husband obviously survived that, that conversation, right? <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> once again, I think sometimes people are so worried about getting into it. It's like you, you work through it like any other aspect of marriage, right? Any other aspects of relationships that you're invested in. Dan, I have one for you. Um, what would you say is a constructive way to react when a child, a young child, um, says something racist? So I think, so I, as we've talked b- before, the thing not to do is not to say anything. Um, and I also think that um, you need to, uh, you know, address the issue, but in a way that kind of, ask some questions like why did you say that or why did you say it like that just to kind of get an idea you know maybe a little bit of where that you know where that came from I also want to say that I think that um um parents sometimes think that they got to say something right there in the moment and where that is good if you have something to say if you're not quite sure or you or you you know, know that you totally messed up that moment, it's really okay to go back and do repair. There are, you know, you can go back and say to that child, you know, remember when you said this and I didn't say that, say much of anything? Well, I really should should not have been silent. And what I wish I would have said is, and then go on and say, you know, what, what it is that you want to say. So there's always times to go back and do that repair you know, when your, when your child has said something, but it is important to, uh, to address it. Um, and, you know, depending on the child's age, you know, like Rosemary said, children do understand fairness when they're very young. And so you might have a conversation about, you know, what, you know, is that fair for you to say, you know, what you said? Um, it's also sometimes children might use, um, derogatory terms that they have heard other people say and um they say it and they might and they, and they probably do know that it's derogatory but they may not know why it is um and so you know in a developmentally appropriate way you know you can have a conversation about why that word is hurtful to some people because they will understand being hurtful um and so i think you know it's it's just good to have you know um, to address the issues, but remember that it's also okay to go back and do repair. Thank you. Rosemary, similar question. Uh, Rosemary, excuse me, similar question. Uh, when it comes to teachers, you know, uh, at times stepping in it in the same way, right? Where they, they say something that, that um, or other caregivers, um, that is racist. How would you suggest um, a parent uh, engage you know, Deshaun, I think it's really important to create what I call a treasure chest of responses. And this treasure chest will contain amazing responses that can be used in a variety of ways and circumstances. Because as Diane said, if, if you don't know what to say in that moment, you'll say nothing. I love the idea of going back to repair. But If you have also a treasure chest of responses, then you you have an idea of of how to disrupt that in the moment Mm -hmm. with children and adults. And and things like, I wonder why you said that. Did you mean to be hurtful? Mm -hmm. 
Tell me more about that. I'm sorry, but I don't find that funny. Or that word doesn't help our friends if they're children to feel safe here. Hmm. Or when you use that word, it really goes against the welcoming environment we're trying to use. It helps to disrupt that in the moment. Parents can use it. Teachers can use it with each other to disrupt microaggressions. And then teachers can use it with children as well. Um, when my son was two, his teacher, I love her, her name is Debbie. And um, she said, oh, your son is so cute. He looks like buckwheat. <sighs> For the record, someone asked earlier, there are some things you can't say. Buckwheat to a black person is one of them. <laughs> yeah. um, and I just said, let's talk about that. I was dropping my son off, going to work. I said, let's talk about that. And she said, did I say something? And I said, yeah, but don't worry. We'll talk about it when I pick him up. Bothered her all day. She called me at work and we talked it through. But it was done. My grandmother always said, speak the truth in love. I know you didn't know. Now you know. Let's not do that again. Because the other part of disrupting this is giving people the space and grace to grow. That's mm -hmm. important. Someone asked in the, in the Q&A, can we say Indians? No, we can say natives, Native Americans, indigenous people. People really don't like labels that were given to them by their colonizers. Mm -hmm. So we used, when I grew up, we said Eskimos and Indians. Anybody as old as I am who use those terms? Mm -hmm. Now we know better. So when you're disrupting something like that, or even the term dreadlocks, mm -hmm. there are people who say, my hair is not dreadful. Please don't call them dreads. We call them locks. But when we give people the space to grow, you can say, oh, someone says, Diane, and I'm assuming you have locks, your hair, you yeah. have your hair yeah. um, pinned up. Diane, I love your dreadlocks. The way you disrupt that is to say, you, oh, thank you so much. That's a compliment. And by the way, we don't use dread anymore. They're just locks. Yeah. You see how easy that is. So that's how we disrupt the microaggressions and acts of racism. It doesn't have to be with hostility, right? It's part of what I'm hearing you say there, but it's direct. It's clear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. So Bridget, I've got, I've got one for you as well. Uh, as we think about this work and, you know, you lead trainings what do you think is going well and where can the larger community go uh, to learn more about this, like to, to go deeper? What kinds of resources are available? What kinds of practices might they be fold into their, their, um, their work to be stronger a year from now than they are today on this front? I think it's important to really give um, suggestions on uh, very concrete things. Um, either things you can say or things you can do. Rosemary mentioned having, you know, this treasure chest of, of responses because it at least gives you something. Um, and, and I think that's the biggest issue that, that people face. It's this fear. And then if there's a situation that happens where maybe they said something wrong and the person got offended or, or said it not with love, but made it very clear that what you said was offensive um, or, or going into, you know, we're just gonna cancel you now, which um, that seems to be a big thing too now with the cancel culture. Um, so they shut down and they're not willing to really work on it anymore. And so I think really what people need are tools, very concrete examples, uh, and even in workshops, having them work through, okay, so here's a scenario, this is what happens. How would you respond? What would you do? Um, more than just, you know, we, we can give presentations and we can, you know, give them things to read, um, but it's, if they can get an opportunity to practice some real life situation that might happen. Maybe what happens later on is not any of the things they practice, but they at least have an opportunity to have thought through several scenarios um, and kind of learn to stumble through it. Because in the beginning, that probably is what's gonna happen. You're gonna have to stumble through it. And again, you know, you're gonna say the wrong thing, you're gonna do the wrong thing, and you're gonna have to give yourself you know, the space to do that and forgive yourself for, for doing that and then 
come back to it, you know, pick yourself up and go back to it. Um, and so I really think what's necessary more than um, just watching a, a one hour presentation or, or reading an article, really these hands on trainings with scenarios and having them really work through that. And knowing once again that if you begin now, you'll be better in a year. <laughs> it sounds like you're saying well, absolutely. you're, you're, you're yeah. going to stub your toe, but mm -hmm. you're not going to get there if you don't move. They, I understand that there's a law in the books about diversity training for child care providers, but it isn't actually enforced. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yes. So, <laughs> so what I, this is what I know about that. Um, so many years ago, I'm not ex sure exactly which year, um, the legislature put into law that as um, child care providers, you know, new child care providers are coming into the field, that one of the things that they needed to do to get their license was to take some kind of diversity training. Um, and so what happened is that um, providers started uh, complaining about this, that they didn't want to take the course, um, primarily providers that didn't feel like they had a diverse clientele. So if they had um, children, you know, like, like, for instance, if all of their clientele was white, they didn't feel like they needed to take that course. So, um, so what, what I've been told by people that were working in the licensing at the time is that so many providers complained that the state decided to stop enforcing that uh, law. And so eventually, um, I, it sounds like what happened is eventually they stopped offering it because the demand then went way down when they of course stopped enforcing, enforcing it. I believe there's many efforts now to, um, to provide training, you know, of course, for providers on, you know, diversity, implicit bias, and, and all of those things, but it is currently still not um, required for people that are getting a license. Yeah, that sounds like something worth following up on. You know, we're at time, and I just want to say this has been just an excellent conversation. I've, I've learned a ton, um, and I'm, I'm so appreciative of your time and your talents and your passion around these these issues and really hope that um, we look up in a year and the circles we're in feel like they're stronger because we've continued to do this work. Um, you can look for this conversation to air in NPR and as a final episode of the first season of the Early Risers podcast. And we'll follow up with those of you who participated in this online event uh, with emails on dates and times for that. Um, there are a ton of resources on the Little Moments Count website, Little Moments Count org so for those of you who are looking for more resources books and other other things you can tap into we'll send you that way and just want to thank you all once again hope you have a tremendous day <laughs>